throughout this series, we're going to be thinking about who is Jesus. And I wonder if, uh, just as we think about that question, whether you want to put a comment in on our comments here on Facebook Live, just to answer, who is Jesus? Uh, maybe if you're at home, you want to get some paper out and you might want to draw a picture. Um, using that clue that we've got inside our, our Hubbub's book, um, and think about who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? And we're going to be thinking all about Jesus' identity and what that means for us and for our lives, even in these very strange times that we live in. So let's pray. Lord God, would you open our hearts? Lord, would you speak to us? Lord, would we know heaven touching earth this morning, that your spirit would be poured out upon us, that we would have understanding and insight and confidence to live our lives with you. In Jesus' name, amen. On New Year's Eve this year, we gathered with friends on Zoom. Now, we never imagined that we'd be saying that a year ago. Um, An advantage I found to socializing by video call is that by keeping the cheese board just out of view of the camera, no one other than my wife has any idea just how much of it I have devoured. And we spent the evening on a great adventure by playing an online escape room with Sherlock Holmes. And we had a Sherlock Holmes-inspired series of mysteries to solve. Dr. Watson set us off on the trail of a bizarre set of petty crimes that seemed to be linked together. And this took us towards midnight and um, an empty cheese board. And finally, the culprit was caught. Over the next six weeks... Up until Lent, we're going to be following this sermon series called Jesus, Man of Mystery. And we're going to be mostly focused upon Mark's gospel and trying to understand who is this Jesus who tries to keep his identity hidden. And as we explore this mystery, it's my hope and prayer that we will discover more about ourselves and our purpose that causes us to live with a sense of urgency. Now, Mark begins his gospel by letting the reader into a secret of Jesus' identity. He writes this, The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. Now, as Jesus begins his public ministry, he remains a rather mysterious figure. Much of the tension comes as we observe different people trying to understand who Jesus is. People experiencing his miracles and his teaching. And as Jesus reveals more and more of his identity, he keeps reinforcing the need to try and keep it all quiet. He he wants them to keep it a secret. He doesn't want them to tell everyone. And you may find yourself asking, what on earth is going on here? Well, I believe that to truly understand Jesus' identity, we have to wait until the cross. And maybe Mark is highlighting that we must understand Jesus' glory in light of his suffering and his death. Certainly, Mark introduces the shadow of the cross very early in his gospel. Now, there is an urgency to the way that Mark tells the story. Mark is the shortest and the earliest of the gospels to be written. And there's lots of things that Mark doesn't include in the story. But there are enough clues along the way to discover who Jesus is and how we're to live out our lives with purpose as his disciples. And so today we have the teaser. There is something almost cinematic in Mark's account and in the way that he shows us something that is to influence the scenes that are to follow. This is a moment of clarity at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, a teaser for all that we will discover later on. We are in on the secret of Jesus' identity. And over the next few weeks, we will discover the clues of what this means for us. One of the hallmarks of Mark's gospel is the inclusion of geographical details, acting almost as markers for the story. We have a contrast that is drawn between John the Baptist's location and Jesus' hometown. John has the whole of the Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem streaming to him. It's a movement from places of spiritual significance to him out in the wilderness. And in contrast, Jesus comes from Nazareth. 
a place of such insignificance that it must be clarified for the reader as being in Galilee. Galilee will be the focus for the first half of Mark's gospel and actually the entirety of our series that we follow. Galilee was at this time ruled by Herod Antipas who, and it was administratively separate from Judea which was ruled by a Roman governor. Galilee was a place of strong Jewish nationalism uh, and there were a few larger cities in Galilee but the gospel accounts do not ever record Jesus visiting them as part of his ministry. And although the, the gospels do record Jesus leaving the area to minister and going to some of the larger places and places of, of more significance, Jesus' focus seems to be on small, insignificant Galilean towns and mostly villages. And the first clue that we, we have, this, this man of mystery, uh, comes from the testimony of John. And John writes this, After me comes one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The one more powerful connects us with Isaiah 40, verse 3, a verse which is used by Mark to introduce this section of the gospel. John is preparing the way for the Messiah. That to untie the straps of sandals was the responsibility of a lowly servant. And it was not something that a Jewish person was supposed to do. John is stating that the one who is coming is so much more powerful than he, that he's not even worthy to do this humble task. John's ministry of calling people to repentance, turning away from their sin, was the path that was to be readied for the Messiah. And John's baptism then was a sign indicating repentance. And a greater baptism is announced by John. The promised Holy Spirit will be poured out with the coming of the Messiah. Now, the next clue is rather puzzling. Mark describes that Jesus was baptized by John. Again, what is going on here? Jesus is baptized not as a sign of repentance, but to fully identify with sinful humanity. And here Jesus does this symbolically, but on the cross, that is Jesus' real baptism. That's where he fully identifies with us, by taking on our sin, dying for us, and then rising again to new life. And as soon as Jesus is baptized, something incredible happens. Mark introduces this with one of his favorite words, immediately. Watch out for this word. He's using it time and time again. In fact, he's going to use it 41 times. Reading from the, from the ESV version, we read this. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. Now, the, the tearing open of the heavens connects us with Isaiah chapter 64, verse 1. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence. To rend is an old word uh, meaning to tear or to rip. In Isaiah, it was part of a prayer for spiritual revival. A longing for God to tear open the distance and cover between heaven and earth and to come down in our time of need. Heaven is God's dimension behind reality. And here in this moment, the invisible curtain is pulled back. The spirit descends like a dove. Now this again is surely another clue for us. Are you noting them all down? Are you taking note of them? Now, now the dove, J Noah, Noah's gentle dove hovered over the ark of salvation and the waters of judgment. Maybe there's a connection for us there. The spirit hovered over the waters of creation. And how the spirit hovers over the waters of baptism, out of which God will call 
his new creation. The Spirit descends, and then the voice of the Father echoes from heaven. You are my Son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Now, we see here this wonderful picture. We see the relationship of the Trinity as Jesus is anointed by the Spirit and affirmed by the Father. The word Messiah means anointed one. Jesus is anointed by the Holy Spirit, marked out as God's Son. There are echoes of Psalm 2 verse 7 where we read, He said to me, You are my Son. Today I have become your Father. The title Son of God is used in the Old Testament to refer to Israel. It's used of humans, it's used of angels too. But the mystery that will be revealed is that Jesus is the Son of God in an even deeper sense. Jesus is the Son of God in a unique sense, in that he possesses the same nature as God. And that's one of the ways that this phrase, the Son of, was, was understood. It meant to possess the same nature. And yet the, the mystery that Mark especially underlines in his gospel is that Jesus is also fully human. In Mark's gospel, we read of Jesus getting tired and hungry. He expresses anger and sadness. He's moved with compassion. Mark offers us Jesus, fully divine and fully human. What a mystery. Wayne Grudem, the systematic theologian, writes this. The fact that the infinite, omnipotent, eternal Son of God could become man and join himself to human nature forever so that the infinite God became one person with finite man will remain for eternity the most profound miracle and the most profound mystery in all the universe. Wow. Who is Jesus was my opening question. And we've got some comments I can see. A wonderful comment here is that Jesus shows me what God is like. What does this all mean for us today? We've looked at some of the evidence. We've, we've begun to, to learn and examine some of this my, my, mystery. But what have we learned for ourselves today? Well, well, firstly, I believe it shows us that God takes us by surprise. The plan for the salvation of the world begins from Nazareth, an insignificant remote place. And in God's kingdom, status is not as important as attitude. And throughout church history, revival has often originated among the poor, the weak, and the lowly. And secondly, like John, although we too are inadequate compared to the perfection of Jesus, God is content to use us for his great purposes. Despite our nervousness or our incomplete understanding, God is willing to involve each of us in his plans for the world. And so we all have a part to play. And in the coming weeks, as we are drawn to the mystery of Jesus' identity, may we embrace the purposes that he has for us as his disciples, even in these strange and uncertain times. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you that you pour out your spirit upon us. And by the spirit, we can cry out, Abba, Father, that we can draw near to you that we can know you and be known by you. Jesus, we thank you that you reveal to us your true identity as the Savior, as the Messiah, as the Son of God. That in you, Jesus, we can see perfectly what God is like and the relationship that, that our eternal creator longs to have with each of us. And so, Lord, we pray that you would reveal to us more and more the depth of relationship that you long to develop with us, 
Lord, we thank you that you've started a work in each of us that you will bring to completion. So deepen our faith, our relationship in you. Reveal to us more and more your plans and your purposes for our lives, that we would live for you and bring you glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.